Back when North America was a wet, tropical cluster of island continents, there was a monster lurking in the mud that was so powerful it likely displaced all of the large predatory theropods in its range. In this video, we're discussing a terror too much for tyrannosaurs, too huge for its own good, and with a bite force exceeding that of the terrestrial giants like T. rex. We're going to talk about the uncanny power of this prehistoric crocodilian to remain submerged, away from sight, hiding in the sediment even as generations of paleontologists walked right over it, and stick around for a nod to perhaps an even greater beast lurking in the shadows. The emergence of Dinosuchus in the scientific literature was much like the animal itself, stealthy, mysterious, and skulking unnoticed in the sediment, until finally emerging out of the murk as a truly terrifying revelation. Around 80 million years ago, what is now North America was split in two by a vast yet shallow sea. To the west was Laramidia, a long, narrow strip of land now buried under the western states. To the east was Appalachia, an enormous island continent of its own. Between these two continents sat the Cretaceous Sea, also known as the Western Interior Seaway. This wide and shallow stretch of water was only 900 meters deep at its very deepest, shallower even than the Caspian Sea, and it was warm and tropical through much of its 34 million years of existence, warm enough to be home to a plethora of dinosaur and other reptilian animals, including one of the largest crocodilians to have ever existed. A crocodilian so huge, it would no doubt have been able to tackle a full-grown T-Rex. Yet despite its size, the stealthy ambush predator remained secretive, even long after its extinction. Eighty million years later, the east coast of Appalachia would become home to a multitude of black bears, coyotes, raccoons, sea turtles, and ospreys, and one Massachusetts-born geologist, Ebenezer Emmons, who, in 1852, was pottering around on the rocks at a location known as the Coachman Formation in North Carolina, also known as the Tar Heel Formation. This is a gold mine of late Cretaceous fossil finds, and it was here that the 59-year-old would document our first evidence of the monster croc. But Emmons wasn't quite on the money. His description of the teeth matched so closely with a description from England of teeth belonging to the pliosaur polytychodum that he declared they must be of the same animal. In fact, in a sad case of dramatic irony, Emmons himself acknowledged that these teeth had originally been assumed to have been from an extinct undescribed species, but he contradicted this assumption in his 1858 report of the North Carolina Geological Survey, where he states, The foregoing description of Professor Owen of the genus Polytychodon applies so well to our teeth that there can remain scarcely a doubt as to their genetic identity. To Emmons' credit, around this time Polytychodon was assumed to have been a genus of crocodilians rather than pliosaurs, so he wasn't totally off the mark. Three years after the Emmons report, a baby was born in Illinois who would grow up to become known as the King of Collectors. As a boy, John Bell Hatcher spent time mining coal to raise money to go to school, and it was here that he discovered his first fossils, leading to an interest in paleontology. Whenever you see an archaeological or geological dig, and you notice those grids of string cast over the site, it's likely you can credit Hatcher for this. Hatcher was a relentless fossil hunter, working for Princeton, Yale, and the United States Geological Survey, among others, and contributing substantially to the world of paleontology, including pioneering the first modern understanding that South America and Australia were once part of the same landmass. He amassed an enormous private collection, too, and he contributed to collections you can now find in places like Yale, the Peabody Museum, Stanford University, and Carnegie Museum. Just one year before he died in 1904, Hatcher discovered several osteoderms, or bony scale formations, to sitting on the ground in Willow Creek, Montana. He attributed them to the heavily armored ankylosaur, but further excavation brought up ribs and vertebrae showing that it was in fact a crocodilian that he'd found. 
Hatcher dismissed the entire find as uninteresting and decided to spend his focus on animals that he found more appealing. So, yet again, this prehistoric giant evaded discovery. But in 1909, five years after Hatcher's death, his colleague and the director of Carnegie Museum, Reverend William Jacob Holland, who'd built a reputation making butterflies appealing, took over interest in the rejected crocodilian. This new discovery amounted to an entirely new genus and species, and in Hatcher's honor, Holland named it Dinosuchus Hatcheri, Hatcher's terrible crocodile. The Dinosuchus was finally emerging. But until the early 2000s, Dinosuchus remained a bit of a mystery. The bones found in Willow Creek were particularly smashed and broken, and its true size didn't reveal itself until much later, by which time multiple other highly fragmented remains had shown this to be a widespread animal across both sides of the Western Interior Seaway. At the turn of the century, what was assumed to have been a monster crocodile was being reclassified as a member of the alligator superfamily. And, like modern alligators, Dinosuchus had a wide mouth with a bulbous tip at the end of its nose. But unlike modern alligators, it had some curious holes in its skull, the purpose of which are still a matter of discussion. And even more unlike modern crocodilians, Dinosuchus grew to at least ten meters long and could have weighed five tons or more. From such fragmented remains, a lot about this giant has left to be desired. But what we do know is that Dinosuchus was enormous. There are no other crocodilians alive today that are anywhere near this big, with the largest extant croc on record being a saltwater crocodile measuring 6.2 meters long. But there are no other prehistoric crocs from North America that could keep up with Dinosuchus either. It probably looked a lot like modern American alligators, only tremendous. But there were some unique elements too. Its enormous armored scutes weren't only broad, but also very tall and rounded, almost hemispherical, and likely played a supportive role for the animal's massive bulk. Its lower vertebrae had dorsal spines much thicker and wider than modern genera, and from other inferences about its habitat, these may prove to have been useful for covering very long distances across hundreds of miles of salt water. The locations of fossils of Dinosuchus strongly imply that this was a coastal gator, occupying the estuarine and brackish banks where the land met the ocean. It could also have lived for a very long time, which would go some way to explaining how large it got. In the western habitats, it grew to its largest sizes, but in the eastern ones, it was more abundant. This could suggest a brutal level of cannibalistic competition in the west, perhaps where prey was less abundant and only the monsters could survive. Dinosuchus is found on both sides of the western interior seaway, which is puzzling to a point. The narrowest passings across this water body would have been hundreds of miles, and crocodilians aren't known for their ability to tolerate such journeys especially across salt water, but fossils have also been found in marine sediment, which certainly could have been swept out there from riverine habitats after the animal had died, but could also suggest that Dinosuchus was confident in the open ocean. And there are other clues that play into this idea, those holes in its skull that we mentioned earlier. They're known as fenestrae, and animals happen for all kinds of reasons, some are for passing nerves through, others for blood vessels or muscles. Some of them are to lighten the overall weight of the skull. And this is one of the suggestions that researchers have made in response to the holes in the skull of Dinosuchus. But in one specimen, it appears there are structures in the front of the snout that would have connected the fenestrae to the sinuses and therefore the respiratory system. The paper describing this structure states that its functional significance is unknown. But should Dinosuchus have sported a pair of salt glands somewhere in its skull, they may very well have expelled into the nasal cavity like they do in marine iguanas. Other hypotheses include thermoregulation, as the enhanced vascularization would have provided a handy heat-exchanging surface for an enormous animal to dissipate some of its warmth. There is other limited evidence that this genus could handle more salt water than extant crocodilians, who themselves are well known to spend lots of time in marine environments, swimming between islands, consuming salty foods, and removing excess salt via lingual salt glands. However, gharials, caimans, and the cousins of Dinosuchus, the gators, don't have these. 
Perhaps their ancestral salt glands were elsewhere and have been since lost. So with all that out of the way, what did this beast eat? The teeth that Emmons described in 1856 have since been attributed to Dinosuchus. He described them as thick and conical and slightly curved, strong and robust. And their close resemblance to pliosaur teeth give a strong impression that fish were a big part of the Dinosuchus diet. A grotesque alligator of this size would have been big for a reason, though, and this strongly suggests a diet rich in red meat, too. Much like the Nile and saltwater crocodiles, this colossal crocodilian would have lurked in the muddy banks, taking on large prey in areas where the giant theropods couldn't go. Tooth marks on hadrosaur bones implies these would have been on the menu, and no doubt in areas where water was drinkable, Dinosuchus would have been a terrifying prospect to any terrestrial dinosaur thirsty enough to risk it. Dinosuchus was common in an area of Kansas known as Hell's Aquarium. Eighty million years ago, this now dusty terrestrial landscape was part of a huge body of water teeming with giant predators, and Dinosuchus likely held its own as an apex predator, too large to worry about anything else. Its teeth are almost as large as the most infamous of tyrannosaurs, T. rex. But could rexy have been a snack for this wallowing giant? Not likely. T. rex came in a little later than Dinosuchus, but the tyrannosaurs of the time were much smaller and definitely snack-sized for this huge alligator, who was twice as heavy as they were at the time. It may have gone for other well-known dinosaurs like Triceratops and the Achillosaurs, especially in areas where Dinosuchus grew to its largest. Some even go as far as to suggest that the presence of Dinosuchus was the very reason there are so few large predatory theropods in the late Cretaceous Appalachian region. Smaller Dinosuchus would likely have been more opportunistic and taken smaller prey, a lot like modern-day alligators. There are also tooth marks on the shells of ancient turtles, and this is something we see analogues of today in modern alligators, who were more than capable of popping a turtle, just like a grape. Yet, as strong as extant crocodilians are, they have nothing on Dinosuchus. Modern crocodilians have the strongest bite force of any known animal. With almost 1,700 kilograms of crushing force administered by the jaws of one 5-meter, 500-kilogram saltwater crocodile, to put that into perspective, humans have around 40 kilograms of bite force, and this is at the molars where the bite is strongest, so the salty has 40 times this amount of force. The bite of Dinosuchus has been estimated to have been as high as 10,500 kilograms, six times that of our salty, and possibly more than twice that of the T-Rex. And if you want to see the kind of brutes that T-Rex was up against, check out our video on that one. But before you do, we have to tie something up here. It's very possible, even likely, that Dinosuchus wasn't the biggest crocodilian ever to live. That title may still be up for grabs, but a top contender is certainly Purosaurus. Fossils of Dinosuchus are still very fragmented, and there's still not much to go on, but Purosaurus makes a very strong claim to it. If you'd like us to make a video on that, please give us a like and click on the subscribe button, and we can keep this channel going, and leave us a comment below for more topics like this you'd like us to cover. That's it for this video. As always, thanks for watching.